You're watching Beyond Market. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. Many thanks for joining us today. On today's show, we'll explore ways to curb violence against women. You can join today's conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets. You can also send your thoughts, your comments to my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awuni. As part of efforts to raise awareness on the prevalence of gender-based violence in Nigeria, the Women at Risk Foundation plans to hold what it calls a No Tolerance March in November this year. Kemi Da Silva Ibro, the founder of WARIF and a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist, joins me as we delve into how Africa's largest economy can curb violence against its women. Kemi, thank you so much. It's thank a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. So I'd like us to just... I know, Wari, if you, you have a couple of partnerships and, you know, in terms of how you assist women who mm. have been victims of violence, but I just want to take a, a few steps back and just ask you how this all started. Why did you start this? Okay, so WARIF is an acronym for the Women at Risk International Foundation. And this is a non-profit organization that was established by myself in 2016. And very simply, it was established in response to the prevalence of rape, sexual violence, and trafficking of young girls and women in communities across Nigeria. Now, my personal background is as an obstetrician and a gynecologist. And I have been practicing in that space now for 15 years. So when I moved back to Nigeria after my postgraduate studies, I started working in the public sector. And I started seeing groups of women that were disenfranchised, women that were survivors of these horrendous acts. They were many a time seen in um, public medical facilities because there weren't any safe spaces and designated spaces for them. And um, the attention that was given to them was minimal, to say the least. So I was back then able to offer, in at least my medical capacity, some sort of assistance. So I would be able to treat the cuts and bruises. I would perhaps be able to take the more extensive injuries into the operating room. But it was clear to me that so much more needed to be done. And so we continue to do this in my personal capacity, myself and my team, until 2016, when I believe my um, line in the sand, as I always refer to it as, was a two-year-old that was brought to my attention that had been violently raped. And I use that word deliberately because we tend to shy away from that word when it comes to children. But this was a two-year-old that had been raped by her biological father. And her injuries were so extensive that even as an experienced gynecologist, I had difficulty addressing this. And so I decided then that some more structure needed to be put in place for the assistance that I was able to offer. And I needed a vehicle, hence the establishment of the foundation war. Hmm. Now when you, I mean, in speaking to this, uh, to the victims, the women, what did they tell you in terms of when you, ask, when you ask them, okay, so what are you going to do about this? What action are you taking? Who have you spoken to? I'm talking about the authorities mm. now. What's, what well, is the usual Well, a lot response? of times, the women that are survivors of these crimes, because they are crimes, are women that have been subjugated in their different relationships for many years. The narrative will tell you that typically that perpetrator is a person that's well known to that survivor, usually a family member, that uncle, father, sometimes a teacher, sometimes even a religious leader that um, this survivor is exposed to. In many of time, places that are supposed to be considered safe spaces, like your home or school or in a church. And then you also have to remember, Esther, that we're living in a patriarchal country where women are generally subjugated anyway. And so here's a woman that's been abused violently, probably started many years prior. She's in an environment where she's encouraged not to speak out because we spend so much more time being worried about the dignity of our family name and the impression that will be given to our neighbor as opposed to addressing the needs of our children and these young women. Did you find that to be the case in many instances? Many a time. Many a time you would have the survivor recanting her story, following assistance that we render, and explaining to her, because many of them aren't even aware of their legal rights. And so these are women that when you see, you first have to establish the medical attention, you then have to give her the counseling that's so necessary, 
A big part of the medical attention is the provision of the HIV tests and other sexually transmitted diseases that could be contracted. Forensic medical examinations are also critical because this then assists the law enforcement in then identifying and being able to capture the perpetrator. And then, of course, as a rape crisis center, which Warish Center, one of the initiatives that the organization implements, offers, is we also offer, um, in addition to all the services I have just listed, welfare, social welfare. And this is where the legal aspect comes under. Many a time, as I said, if home is the place of abuse, then we need to take you out of that place of risk. And so we collaborate with organizations that have these shelters that we can then move you to. We collaborate with organizations and law firms that can offer pro bono services. And do, so you they, actually, do right. they actually take it forward? Yes, they do. In terms of prosecuting? Yes, they do. If okay. you're willing to actually sit down with them and say, you know, I am ready now to take this abuser to court, they're willing to walk right next to you, hand in hand, and walk you through the process. And then we also look at vocational skills, because many a time we make these decisions because we are financially constrained. Women that don't have financial means and worried about leaving the home with her children and has no way of bringing up her children, sending them to school, and even their basic livelihood is constrained and will probably be stuck in that home of abuse. So again, the Warrior Center is able to provide, in addition to the medical and counseling, all of these services. And I okay. must emphasize that we do all of this free of charge. Now, I know that in the last couple of years, the conversation around gender-based violence you know, has you know, gathered a lot of steam, a lot of momentum. There have been pressure on our lawmakers to make you know, stronger laws, and not just making the laws, mm -hmm. enforcing these laws, especially across states, making schools and other places you know, safer spaces. We've seen campaigns, awareness, etc. I'm just wondering, for you, from when you started up until now, what major changes would you say have taken place, perhaps on the, the law from side? The legal from the standpoint. legal standpoint. Well, from a legal standpoint, there has certainly been an amendment to the laws. I mean, when I first started, we had just the penal and southern pen um, criminal codes that did define rape as you know, unlawful penetration without consent, be it you know, vaginally or anally. But since then, we've had the VAP law, which has now become an amendment to the existing laws and has now included both gender, men and women, which we didn't have prior to 2015. And we also have now the definition of gang rape, where you have multiple perpetrators, which again wasn't part of the definition of the law prior to the 2015 amendment. And I know that another big uh, barrier is cultural beliefs. How do you get around that? Where you know you have to. You talked about some of the women even recanting because mm -hmm. you know family name yes. protection and all of that. But we still live in that in a society where the cultural beliefs are still very deeply rooted. And when it comes to issues like this, people tend to shy away. And I don't know. It's even a bigger problem for the victims themselves. Absolutely. And as you rightly said, we are living in a in an environment that is steeped in traditional norms and cultural practices. And many of these practices either encourage the subjugation of women, or at least certainly don't help the situation that these women find themselves in. And if you're born into a family where you're already taught from infancy that you have a role and a place, and that you cannot speak out if this you know, role or place is actually questioned, or if abuse or violence should occur, then you have a very difficult time having this survivor trust you with her truth. And she, um, when you now create an enabling environment, then it makes it easier for her to be able to speak this truth. Nigeria is in an enabling environment, unfortunately. There is still a big aspect of the victim blaming, as we refer to it, where a woman comes forward to say that you know, this act has occurred, and it's actually her community that turns on her and starts asking questions like, well, why you? Esther? What were you wearing that day, Esther? Were you out after 7 p.m., Esther? What does it matter? As opposed to identifying that you know, this act has occurred, this crime has happened, and regardless of the circumstances, this woman did not choose this. So let's turn our focus to the rapist. But we spend all our time and energy questioning the authenticity and the role of the raped individual. But are you encouraged by the laws that we've seen you know, emerge and then the authorities that are in charge? Um, is, would that be the Ministry of Women yes, Affairs? The, 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 we actually have um, quite a number of different ministries okay. that play a part in the fight against gender-based violence. 
Lagos State it happens to be one of the more progressive states. We have the Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Response Team, and this is a multidisciplinary team of different specialties and different ministries, including WORTH okay. as um, a non-profit organization. And the idea behind it was very clear. Bring experts from the different aspects, including law enforcement as well, together. And then this particular team can then tackle these issues. Okay, so it's a multi-stakeholder approach to, exactly. to the problem. Exactly. What about, okay, so that on the one hand, and then letting on the other side of the coin, the population of, of women and even, you know, men, since, I mean, this, this actually goes both ways. Both What's, what would you say is a level of awareness? Do people know that, okay, when this happens, I it's can increasing. go here? The level okay. of awareness is increasing. I mean, the conversation now with regards to rape, sexual violence, I think more and more we're having them. Um, I wouldn't say we're there yet in terms of full awareness. I mean, I always remind people that Nigeria is still 54% rural. And so a lot of times when we talk about awareness, we basically assume that everyone has access to the websites that are readily available or the blogs or social media. But the woman in the rural Nigeria still hasn't got access to those, um, if you will. So how, how, sh how can all of this trickle down to the grassroots? So what we've been, the ones we need them Exactly. So what we've been able to do at the organization is working under three specific pillars, the health, education, and community service. We've been able to holistically address the issue and tackle the issue successfully. Now, under our community service, we have an initiative referred to as the gatekeeper's community whereby we go into these rural areas and we've trained the traditional birth attendants, the local midwives that reside in these communities as first responders. So in other words, this is a woman that's informally trained and looks after the women and the expectant mothers in her community. She's very well respected. She's trusted and she's typically the custodian of these secrets. However, she had no, if you will, training or she had no awareness with regards to what to do when she comes across these cases. So we've successfully trained a thousand of these midwives in all the different local government areas in Lagos State. And we've been able to see as a result of that over 260 active cases to date because now they have in place a system whereby they can recognize these cases and more importantly, refer them so they can seek appropriate care. Okay, Kemi, at this point, I'm just oh, going to have to thank you for your time. If you're just joining us, Kemi Da Silva Ibru, founder of the Women at Risk Foundation and a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist is with me today on Beyond Marketing. We are exploring ways to curb violence against women in Nigeria. Kemi, thank you for your time so far. Thank Let's you. speak from where we left off. We've talked about awareness, we've talked about, I mean, from the legal perspective, uh, and we talked about, I mean, the impact that, let's talk about the impact that all of that is having on bringing down the numbers. But then speaking about numbers, in terms of data, how robust is the data that we have in terms of where this is occurring, how many, and how we can use that to also address the problem? So as with many industries, um, including health, we have minimal data when it comes to gender-based violence. As an organization from the inception, we've had a strong monitoring and evaluation unit and we've been able to measure everything from the magnitude of the problem to the initiatives that we implement so that we can actually quantifiably say, are they effective and how effective are they? Now, the magnitude, one in four girls before age 18 in Nigeria today would have had at least one violent sexual encounter. And of that, 70% of them would have had more than one. And we're 200 million people, Esther. 100 million of us are women and 60% of us are under the age of 24. So we're looking at over 10,000 girls every day being raped in our country. In terms of the initiatives that we implement, we're able to see a significant increase, both in the knowledge as well as behavioral change, both with the male or boy child when it comes to educational initiatives, and the girl child when it comes to the female community initiatives as well as the educational initiatives that we're able to implement in secondary schools. And so we're able to say that, yes, the numbers are um, increasing with regards to the awareness and the reach. And by extension, we would like to say that, therefore, the numbers are dropping with regards to the extent of the problem, but unfortunately not fast enough. In terms of uh, stakeholder 
participation and engagement. I know that apart from WIRE, there are other NGOs too who are also in this space, or perhaps uh, hopefully partnering with the government. Would you say that do we need a significant more to come into this space in terms of the number of foundations such as yours to come into this space, partner, and then so that we can actually see a significant Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I mean, partnerships and collaborations are critical. Because if we spend all our time working in silos, then how do we then actually quantifiably reach the multitudes of women and young girls that are in dire need of services? So we're very particular about partnering and collaborating with both governmental agencies as well as private organizations that are willing to take on this issue and work in the space. Well, speaking about partnerships, I know you, you did have a partnership with the U.S. consulate. Yes, this we was have, on, on sex trafficking. We actually have an ongoing okay. partnership with the U.S. consulate. And as you rightly said, um, specifically the area of concern was the sex trafficking of young girls and women from West Africa, to, um, in this regard from Nigeria, to um, other source countries as well as destination countries. And these are countries that are typically in Europe, um, the most common being Italy, although Italy, I believe France and Germany now are also um, destination countries for trafficking. I'm just wondering, I mean, I know that, I mean, I would imagine that some of them are very strong cartels and, you know, they've been doing this for decades. How oh, do yes. you penetrate? How do you oh, yes. break I mean, that chain? With great difficulty. I mean, the trade in itself is a high profit, low risk trade. I mean, globally, it's $150 billion annually. And so you can see why the attraction is there. And then you're working with a group of women that unwittingly or not are complicit in the trade because they've made that decision in some instances. In others, unfortunately, they've been, again, tricked into the situation. And then when they are trafficked, they're, again, ostracized and all by themselves. Before they make the journey, I'm sure you've heard the stories, many of them are taken to our local shamans and babalawas. Many of them are made to take these blood oaths that psychologically they do believe. And so they're of the opinion that if they were to leave the trade, if they were to run away, they would meet death. Their parents and their family members would also meet fates worse than death. And so you have this unholy allegiance between the sex trafficker and um, this trafficked young girl. I mean, the average age of a girl being trafficked today is 15 across um, you know, global countries. And in Nigeria today, when we look at our statistics, as limited as they are, we know that at least 900,000 men and women, apparently 60% of them of that number are women, have been trafficked. As of last year, we're told that 60,000 Nigerians are trapped in Libya from the trade. Because mm. uh, that, that on itself, in itself, the sex trafficking, that is, I mean, I know it's part of this conversation, but that on its, its own, it's, it's a, a whole big, different I know, topic I, I on don't its want own. Us to get to you. But let me, let's br bring this back to, again, law enforcement. I know you've done, because we've had cases where when it comes to involving law enforcement, especially the police, then we still. Interestingly, we still see cultural practices and beliefs, you know, playing a big role where, you know, it, women go to poli certain police stations and are turned back and told to go it, that it's a domestic issue between the husband and wife and they should go back home and settle it. But I know you've done some training with, in terms, in terms yes, of case we management. We Talk to us about uh, that. Again, it's an ongoing initiative that we're implementing. Um, as you rightly said, um, sensitization of the policeman and the challenges that a woman meets when she goes into the police station is one that's well documented and we've all heard the stories. And so our um, decision was to address this by going into these police stations and actually undergoing gender sensitization and awareness training with police officers. So we identified that there are at least 190 police stations in Lagos State alone. And so we took on this Herculean task of going into each one of them over a designated period of time. So to date, we've reached over 500 police officers. And um, we're seeing a significant change, perhaps not necessarily in the behavior, but now what we've done is we've put in place processes and protocols okay. so that that police officer now knows what to say, how to say it, what the expectation of this interaction will be, and to appreciate why it is critical 
to send a young lady that visits the police station to an organization and a center like Worth within a 72-hour window. Because when, within that period of time, we're able to then run the forensic medical examinations that are necessary because all the specimens post 72 hours become biodegradable and they'll be difficult to use. We're able to start the post-HIV drugs in scenarios where we're trying to, again, decrease the risk of HIV. And so that in itself is such an important aspect of at least her medical treatment. And then we can then start be to start the psychosocial trauma intervention and counseling, which is as important as the medical therapy. So usually, I mean, without worry, this is not part of standard police it is, training. It is. Well, it I mean, I, you, would, you would, training. I mean, well, it should be. <laughs> I can't say to you that it, um, it necessarily is not. Okay. But I find that, you know, we have to reiterate this and the importance of this. Okay. So, I mean, going forward, uh, hopefully, obviously, we can bring down the numbers. But what, uh, what is, in terms of structures, more structures you want to put in place and perhaps even more partnerships, what are your hopes in terms of how we can significantly bring down the numbers and change the narrative? So presently, as I said, I mean, we work with a unique approach under our three pillars, the health, education. I mean, under the education, for example, it is clear that the most vulnerable age for both the boy child and the girl child it's between the ages of 12 and 16. But it's also the age that is the formative age of that young person. So for us to be able to change our narrative and for us to begin to reduce the number of cases, we have to start addressing that age group. We have to look at the girl child and educate her on what it is to be sexually abused. Because when we go into these schools under our education pillar, and we start to educate and train the girls, the very first thing we appreciate is that many of them have been socialized from such a young age that they don't even appreciate it's wrong because they've been abused from age two and age three. Then you have to explain to her why it is it's wrong, and then you have to equip her with a simple toolkit and information. Let her know that there are services available, let her know these services are free, and that they're easily accessible to her. And then with that boy child, we have to remind him because he's also from a home of violence. And all he knows is what he sees. And so violence begets violence. And so he has to then be taught. His mindset has to, if you will, be reoriented so that he becomes more of a protector than that potential perpetrator, which would be the eventual conclusion if he were to continue on the path that he is. I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously this needs to scale. And of course, we need for us to have more traction. Absolutely. How can we make that happen? Are you? Like, that's why I mentioned earlier in terms of perhaps more partnerships. So we need so exactly. So right these, now, okay. as you rightly said, we are at a point where we have established initiatives. Okay. We've measured them. They're working, and now it's a function of just scaling up so we have a wider reach. And as you rightly said, again, this can only be done with proper partnerships, increased funding, and of course more attention and a spotlight kept on this issue of gender-based violence. I want violence. to go back to the legal aspect. I know it's a bit, a bit of a tricky one, but mm. you know, many times when there's justice for the victim, it makes the whole experience less you know, painful, less traumatic. How much of that have we seen in terms of prosecutions, actual no, not convictions? Near, not nearly enough. I mean, not nearly enough. Again, it, data is very difficult and not readily available as to the number of prosecutions and number of cases that have been successfully prosecuted. And when I say successfully prosecuted by law, if you've been successfully prosecuted of rape, that's life imprisonment. I mean, by law. But I mean, how many Nigerian in, laws, by, okay. by the Nigerian law today? And that's both under the Northern as well as the Southern Criminal Code. But then how many men in jail today have been jailed for life because of rape? Not nearly enough. So what, why, why do you think that is, sir? Well, I think it's a combination of many reasons. I think it starts from the basic environment that we live in. I think a lot of times we have to understand that when we talk about this rape culture and we you know, use the term rape culture, it really is a culture. And it's a culture because we're all enablers in this environment. We're an enabling environment if we don't speak out. You're an enabling environment if you're that bystander that's aware that your neighbor is abusing that wife of his or that child of his, but you don't intervene because it's not your business. You're an enabling environment if you turn away when you know that that child should be in school at 11 a.m. in the morning, but you see her sweeping outside and you know that the only adult in that home 
is a male presence. So we all have a collective responsibility to do more so that we can start changing this environment and this mindset that we have, this apathy that we have. Because we tend to imagine that because of the sheer magnitude of the problem, it's very difficult for one person to make that change. But it's just that one child or that one woman or man or boy, and you transform one life, and then you see the pay forward, you see the ripple effect. Okay. And with, the, with women, I must say, as I'm sure you would agree, I mean, a woman is the very center, very fabric of not just her home, but of a community. And so if she's broken and abused, then it trickles out, not just to her family, but to the community. All right, Kemi, I'm, I'm, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you so much for your time today. It's thank been an you absolute pleasure much. having you on Beyond Markets today. I've been speaking to Kemi Da Silva Ibro. She's the founder of the Women at Risk Foundation and a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. Well, that's it on Beyond Markets. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember, you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West African Time Daily and have access to all previous episodes of the show on our website at cnbcafrica.com. My name is Esther Wuni. Thank you for watching and have a great day. Mm -hmm.